E-Cancer Television is here at the AACR annual meeting. Paul Spellman from the NCI Bethesda. You're doing one of the biggest jobs around looking at the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA, appropriately named. Uh, and um, you, you're looking at 20 different cancers, typically. Um, and you're finding out what it is about the genes in those cancers that actually influence the progress of the disease, and therefore guide clinicians. Uh, what can you tell me that, that's new? Because we already have groups of patients that we know needed to, need to be treated in a certain way. But can you refine that now that you have this massive atlas available? We are identifying sub-markers sub that are clinically actionable that might exist in a very small fraction of patients. So uh, work we've been doing in ovarian cancer shows the, the presence of uh, um, genetic abnormalities that are already clinically tar targetable, but in 2% of patients. So the idea that you have to target 2% of all patients with high-grade serous ovarian cancer would be a very small number. You know, in the U.S., that'd be 400 patients a year. Could you pick out those subgroups of patients and exclude all other patients from a particular directed therapy? That, that would be the, that'd be the implication, and I think the challenge for the clini clinical group is to actually figure out how to run uh, trials where only a very small number of patients would be, would be entry eligible. Um, <clears throat> the, other, the other major goal would be to pick out the sets of patients where there might be 2% of patients with this abnormality and 2% with that abnormality and use uh, informatic analyses to figure out which patients are the same and therefore it's not 2% it's not in this trial and 2% in that trial, it's 4% that, that have a combination of abnormalities. Mm -hmm. um, that, and, and that'd be a strategy for increasing the size of the population so you didn't have to go down to these very, very small numbers. But it, it may be that you have uh, a, limited, a limited target and that there are patients who will have uh, excellent therapeutic outcomes from, from very particular targeted therapies. Now, looking at the genome atlas, looking at genes, in fact, is quite difficult. Is this something that can get into the lab and be done in the average hospital? It's getting closer. The, the, as the ability to do sequencing drops uh, dramatically, uh, it is now becoming routine for the research community to be able to sequence all the genes in the human genome from a, a regular research lab. That is something that, uh, apart from my job within the Cancer Genome Atlas, I have a research group at Lawrence Berkeley Liber uh, la Laboratory, and uh, we do that in my group, and we have, my group is on the order of 10 people. So it is something that a research lab can do, uh, and it is something that is moving towards the clinically, clinical testing arena where, where we will have probably, certainly within the next five years, in the next two years, the ability to, to have complete gene, exome sequencing, complete genome sequencing on, on individual patients' mm -hmm. tumors. It, complete genome sequencing, it sounds formidable. It, it is quite complex. How do you recommend doctors to get their heads around some of the details and actually apply some of the knowledge? It'll be necessary to work closely with, with the clinical testing laboratories that would provide the service, I think. And so um, it, as, as long as it can be done in that sort of way, the, the data should come back and, and list the aberrations that are present in each individual's case. Um, but there will be many of them that probably mean something and we won't know about for a long time. And so that is, it's, you know, it's the individual case reports of patients who have specific abnormalities in, 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 clin in, in clinical practice uh, and, and then how they respond to therapies would be quite valuable from a, from a research point of view. And mm -hmm. so I think that you know, publishing those interesting case studies would be, would be quite useful. If you do identify some of these subgroups very accurately, how much might you improve the outlook for an individual patient, do you think? It's a good question. So um, I would use uh, trastuzumab as a prime example of, of potential outcomes. So in the metastatic setting, you know, it's a modest increase in overall survival, but the, there are a lot of patients who have HER2-positive disease who are effectively cured as long as in the, in the pre-metastatic setting, in the, in the local lesion setting. So the, the, the big benefit of trastuzumab is not that we get a small increase in patient out, uh, survival for, for those patients who have metastatic disease, it's that patients who don't have metastatic disease can, can be cured by it. And I think that the same thing will be true in, for, for these other lesions. So we'll prove that they have therapeutic benefit in the metastatic setting, and then we'll apply them clinically in, in, the, in, the, in the local disease setting. So that's an example in breast cancer. You also mentioned 
uh, about ovarian cancer. Do you have any other hot tips? Uh, well, TCJ is pursuing 20 different tumors, uh, and in collaboration with the ICGC, there are now 40 different projects being, being taken on worldwide to sequence tumor genomes. Um, and so TCJ, for example, is doing pancreas, uh, lung squamous, lung adeno, um, and uh, colon, rectal, so a very long list of uh, the major killers in the United States. And then the ICGC projects are tackling tumors around the world that are major killers around the rest of the world. So those data um, are uh, being shipped online uh, in, in more or less real time. and, uh, and um, the, the data themselves are quite complex, so to, to directly to clinicians, I think there'll be a slight lag as we, as we try to figure out how to migrate those data to clinicians. Now, you mentioned trastuzumab. That applies to a large number of patients with breast cancer, for, yep. for example, but you were saying that you can target very small groups. Uh, are there examples of, of what you might do for them? Uh, there, there is, in, in our ovarian serous carcinoma study, high-grade serous ovarian can cancers, there is one patient who has a BRAF mutation out of 312 patients. Uh, that's a mutation we understand. There's a patient, there's a, that's a target for which there is a drug that in, in, some, in some aspects works. Uh, it looks like it's working in the melanoma setting. So, uh, you know, as a, as a clinician, if I saw a patient with a BRAF mutation, even in an indication where BRAF is not supposed to be a driver, I would, I would certainly consider it. And, uh, and, you know, if the patient's got metastatic disease, which they mostly do in high-grade serous, I wouldn't expect it to cure them, but I might expect it to help them. So you might, by knowing what's in the gene, you might be able to pick out a, a well-known treatment Absolutely. that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Absolutely, that's right. And so there are a number, this has been published before, but high-grade serous ovarian cancers also have, uh, a, a couple percent of the tumors have focal amplifications of, of HER2. So you could use trastuzumab for those patients as well. So um, there are clinical trials that show that there's no benefit there. <laughs> so, uh, so it clearly is not a perfect theory, but it's, it's one that I think is worth pursuing. How would you like to see cancer doctors using the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA? Um, I, ideally, we would see these translate into clinical trials that, that patient, that bef I mean, I, speaking from personal hi history, uh, my father-in-law, was diagnosed with a neuroendocrine carcinoma about 10 years ago, and he, he's lived about six years. And, um, you know, this was right, he was getting extremely sick right around the time that um, the EGFR work came out showing the point mutations in EGFR uh, and the, the ability for matinib to, to help those patients. And so, you know, we pushed to have his EGFR locus sequenced. And today, I would have pushed to have his whole genome sequenced to. Uh, to be able to look for anything that might have helped them. So I think that you will, I think individual clinicians will start to see this in the clinic that patients want their genome sequenced because they're gonna be able to afford to do it themselves in a lot of cases, you know, for a few, even if the insurance won't cover it, it's a few thousand dollars at this point, $5,000 for a couple different companies who will sequence your genome. So do you recommend people to have the genome sequenced? I don't know that I would recommend it, and it will certainly put strain on the, on the, on the infrastructure of the in the, in this, in the medical community. But as someone who watched someone they loved die, I would have done it. And, and so that's, that's not necessarily policy, but it's something I would have done. So uh, the science, the detailed science of the gene, can make important therapeutic strides forward. I, I think it absolutely can. And, uh, and it, it, to me, it would be worth the risk. Paul Spellman, it's great having you here with us on eCancer Television. Thank you very much.